afternoon and evening and probably occasionally morning for some of you. Whatever time zone you're in, good time zone to you. Welcome to our Athos Arts reading. Athos Arts is an indie press out of Detroit, Michigan that honors its international authors in this 90 minute showcase of short fiction. Today we have for you 14 authors, five time zones, three continents. We have publisher and writer Edie E. Bell. We have Twitch host Gregory Wilson, both of whom are also authors reading tonight. But today we're going to begin our reading with Carlos Hernandez. Professor of English by day and game designer by night, Carlos Hernandez, Twitter handle at Write Teach Play, is also the author of The Assimilated Cuban's Guide to Quantum Santeria, Sal and Gabby Break the Universe, and Sal and Gabby Fix the Universe, and many other works of SFF prose and poetry. Carlos, if you will just introduce the piece you'll be reading from. I would be more than happy to thank you for that spectacular introduction, C.S.E. Cooney, whom I've never met before. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're reading from Rogue Artists today, which is an anthology of artists sticking it to the man. Uh, and so my story today, uh, so happy to be able to kick this off, is called The New Pointillist Manifesto. So imagine turning the art of George Surratt into revolutionary ardor. Uh, I'm gonna start in the middle, uh, about five minutes. Here we go, starting with part two. The point, of course, was not to give every last one of the 18.6 billion persons on earth the power to shape reality. Reality must be agreed upon after all, lest the world collapse in a cataclysm of 18.6 billion competing hot takes. There must needs be a hierarchy. Wealth decided, wealth has always decided, the distribution of power. Nenornia was free to access and use, sure, but thousands of tiers of premium accounts add-on abilities, features, skins, macros, licenses, and signature services granted special privileges to anyone who could afford them. Some police officers, for instance, had the ability to manifest firearms out of thin air, ranging from a simple Glock to a 22K Hornet rifle with a muzzle velocity of 2,445 feet per second and an effective range of 240 yards, but only if their precincts could afford the law enforcement deluxe tier. Most units had to settle for less expensive packages as the law enforcement deluxe tier ran 541 CNY per officer per month. Depending on exchange rates, that tier could single-handedly bankrupt a local police precinct. That's why, for the sake of their shareholders, Nanarnia let any private citizen upgrade themselves to the law enforcement deluxe package providing that the local government allowed it. But generally speaking, governments did. It was better for freedom and for the taxes they collected from chimp to data to punish offenders after the fact than to prevent preventable tragedies. Three, look, the point really was to give everyone the illusion of power. In a series of leaked documents, the world learned of the Hotspur strategy of building a resilient, ever-growing, ever-profitable user base. Hotspur, you'll remember from your Shakespeare, is brash, opinionated, hot-headed, not a bad guy, but not nearly as good as he thinks he is, either as a fighter or a lover, and positively useless as a thinker. He's a dead man by the end of the play, a victim of his own miscalculations and overestimations. Prince Hal says some nice things over his corpse. When Hotspur's body did contain a spirit, a kingdom for it was too small a bound. According to the leaked docs, chimp to data execs saw themselves as noble Prince Hal's and the rest of humanity as a legion of headstrong hot spurs. Let them mouth off, cast insults, win useless victories of wit on social media. Let them complain and threaten. Let them protest and plot. Give them the illusion they have control of their destiny. Use freedom of expression as a loss leader. 
Chimp to Data did not need to slay their Hotspurs in single combat. Single combat was for suckers! Hotspur, you see, valued principles over money. That was his true fatal flaw. Prince Hal would have done much better to drain Hotspur's coffers and max out his credit cards, keep him in debt forever. This is the lesson of dragons. For all their physical prowess, their real power lay in the hordes they slept on. That is why in the Narnia, you could for free know that the pain in your left side is cancerous. You can learn exactly what type of cancer, what the prognosis is, how it might be treated had one the wherewithal, and more or less how long you had to live if you did not have the wherewithal, all without paying a cent. You would also learn, you had to learn. The targeted advertising that knew you had cancer wouldn't not let you learn that there might be ways to use Nanarnia's nanotechnology to cure your cancer. Your visual and audio overlays will become a cataract of cancer ads inundating your virtual existence, which is to say your entire existence, for when were you not logged into Nanarnia? Those nanites had become your insides and your outside, your body and your world. You had no choice but to know that all of Nanarnia's life-saving technology could be yours for a mere 2,199 CNY a month. That, in a nutshell, was life after Nanarnia. You knew so much about everything and could do very little about anything. Or it was, until the new pointillists offered another way. And to find out about that other way, you can read the rest of the story in Rogue Artist. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Carlos. Oh, lovely. Our next reader is Gigi Gengeli, Twitter handle at G-I-G-I-G-A-N-G-U-L-Y, is a Delhi-based writer of speculative fiction. Her debut novella, One Arm Shorter Than the Other, was published in 2022. Gigi, if you want to introduce yourself and what you'll be reading from. Yeah, hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Gigi Gangli. Um, I write speculative fiction and uh, I'll be reading from my debut novella, One Arm Shorter Than the Other, which is set in Delhi, India. So this part that I'm reading, it's about an actor who for some reasons is stuck inside his television set at home. So some time has passed and his wife and daughters are now used to his new place in their lives. So hope you guys like so this section. So some time has passed and his wife so and daughters are now used On weekdays, he gets switched on at 3 p.m. when his daughters come back from school and gets powered down at 10 p.m. At, at bedtime. On weekends, the opening time shifts from 3 p.m. to 12, but the closing hour stays the same. When they need to talk to him face to face, they go to the news channel. The inset windows and the news flash ticker help with the conversation too. But other times they take him to cooking shows, to documentaries, to cricket matches, and even mythological shows. It's a game for his daughters to have their father go through these things. They make him walk, walk for hours in the Gobi Desert, a tiring exercise even for him. But he bears it with a grin to see his daughters enjoy the visuals so much. And when their papa complains or at times scolds them, they just mute him. His wife does that on some occasions too. Like when he objects to getting a loan from her father to pay for his hospital bills, she frowns at him as he traverses the jungles of South America. Well then, what do you suggest? She asks him. Are you going to pay for it somehow? She doesn't wait for an answer from him, instantly muting him and leaving the room altogether in anger. There are times when he is made speechless by choice too. The first time is when they tell him on the very first day that Lalit had uh, tried calling him several times to give him some good news. A lead role for Paritosh in, a, in an art house movie, but had found the telephone engaged. The second time is when three months after the incident, they address him as a team. He can tell even before they open their mouths that they want to discuss an uncomfortable subject. So he braces for the worst. But what they tell him is, we are getting another television set. 
what do you mean? I am here, how can you? We mean no disrespect, Papa, but it's really weird to see you in every film or show we watch. We don't even get to hear all the dialogues with you talking over them. It, it gets a bit annoying, Indrani says. Nandini adds, remember the last time we went to the Royal Palace and you talked so much that others kept shushing you? I think a second TV will be good for all of us, his wife says, her words final. And Paritosh looks on, trying to control his emotions, trying to understand why his family would do such a thing. It is the oddest feeling in the world to feel jealous of the machine. But then he asks, I don't understand. Where will I go? Right here beside us, his wife says, pointing to the space between the two sofa chairs where a tall table has been placed. We've talked to an electrician and he'll fix everything tomorrow. He doesn't know what to say then. The cauliflower florets he'd been frying on the stove to show his girls a new recipe had now burned to a crisp. And there's nothing to do but for him to throw it in the dustbin. Days go by just like this and he settles into his new position in the room and their lives. His eyesight is much better from inside the TV, sharp and defined. He can see things quite clearly inside the room. From where they have placed him, he can see the clock too. He can see the time as it starts to creep towards 10 o'clock and he waits. He knows his wife and children will start to yawn and reason with him that they need their rest for office and school tomorrow. Sometimes he can feel a sense of irritation from them too. The desire in them to say he wouldn't understand, not anymore. He doesn't have to get up in the morning, work the entire day, only to feel tired and drained at night. They never say that, but he can tell they're thinking it. Thank you. That was so cool. I've, I, I really am looking forward to the whole novella. Thank you so much for reading for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next reader is going to be Alana McFall, uh, Twitter handle at A-L-A-N-N-A-M-C-F-A-L-L, is a short story writer, an award-winning playwright, and author of The Traveling Triple C Incorporeal Circus. You'll find her in the Bay Area, California, and at alanamcfall.com. Alana, she, her, will be reading from the Traveling Triple C Incorporeal Circus. Alana, welcome. Hi. Again, my name is Alana McFall, and I'm reading from the Traveling Triple C Incorporeal Circus, um, which is about two ghosts and a mime going on a road trip. So uh, from chapter three. The closer Chelsea got to the park, the more of her fellow ghosts were mixed in with the crowd. Some walked on the street like her, others zipped above people's heads like plastic bags caught in the wind. But Chelsea walked and didn't get a view of the performance until she was almost right on top of it, emerging into the circle with one person in the center, one person and a handful of ghosts. A young black woman jumped around on the pavilion, entertaining the crowd. An oval of stark white paint stood out on the performer's dark face. Little black triangles above and below her eyes emphasized even the smallest expressions, though her face was plenty flexible on its own. Fistfuls of shoulder length dreadlocks were tied into pigtails, high above the collar of her striped black and white shirt. Her motions were energetic and emphatic, from the top of her head, down her chubby body, and to the tips of her toes. Black paint over her lips contorted as she grinned, groaned, yelped, and sobbed, all in total silence. Two years ago, Chelsea had uh, no idea that there were any real mimes still out there. She'd seen them in movies and comedies plenty of times, but portrayed as ridiculous figures, relics of performance styles long since dead. Chelsea had no idea where this woman in her 20s had picked up such an old style, when she would have only ever seen parodies. But when Sandrika performed, there was no irony, no self-consciousness. Every twisted face, every flailing limb, every epic tumble was put on with the utmost sincerity and artistry. Chelsea watched as she flailed her arms and chased some imaginary thing running away from her at approximately hip height. If the balloon dogs being clutched by the small children at the edge of the circle were anything to go by, this was her dog walker performance, 
a little story about her taking care of a rich woman's dog and having to chase it through the streets when it escaped. The balloon animals at her feet weren't really the only clue. The ghost on its hands and knees, crawling away and laughing hysterically, was also a hint. The man's head was bald and his eyes deep and hollowed, and the only thing wrapped around his unearthly body was a hospital robe. But the laugh that echoed out of his empty lungs was deep and booming when Sindrika chased him. A teenage ghost with a knife wound in his gut stood at the edge of the circle, arms crossed over his chest and a mean scowl on his face. When the dog ran past him, the teenager held out a hand and Sandrika skidded to a stop, eyes wide and shocked. People in the crowd chuckled at her huge gestures, the way she pointed with her whole body after the dog, trying to dodge around her play pretend foe. The teenage ghost pointed to something on his chest, an imaginary badge, and his hand rested on his belt in a mimic of a cop tapping his baton. Ghosts in the audience laughed a beat before the humans did, getting the invisible joke before Sandrika had time to react to it, raising her hands in front of her and backing away slowly. She shoved her hands in her pockets as she turned and walked away, shoulders rounded and face twisted downward in a picture of sadness and disappointment. She kicked at an imaginary rock and took a swing at the empty air. But when she jammed her hands back, her eyes went wide and she stood bolt upright, thrilled at a discovery in the depths of her pockets. Pulling it out, she held her empty hand in front of her face. Both living and dead audiences watched, waiting for the reveal, as she held the item close to her ear. A quick squeeze of her fingers and the elation in her painted face make it, made it clear that a squeaky toy was going to be her ticket out of the mess she had found herself in. Children giggled and waved their balloon, am uh, balloon dogs. Adults laughed softly, and the ghosts broke out in cheers and screams, wild hoots and hollers uh, that went unheard by the rest of the crowd. Sundry uh, Chelsea was right along with them. She'd seen this performance plenty of times, but it was easy to get caught up in the fun all over again, and to give Sandrika the encouragement that the humans were too dignified to allow. Armed with her squeaky toy, Sandrika traveled around the circle in hot pursuit of the dog. She bent down and held the toy before her in a plea, squeezing it to bring the wayward animal. Chelsea watched as she tried to attract the dog, ended up with a lot of additional dogs played by yipping ghosts on their hands and knees, and ended up swarmed by the otherworldly pack. The audience of the living ebbed and changed over the course of the show, and plenty of people glanced on their way past and kept walking but the ghosts were there to stay. Sandrika was a celebrity to the dead residents of New York. And yeah, that is just a taste from my 2019 novel, The Traveling Triple C Incorporeal Circus. If you want to hear a lot more about ghosts, mimes, comedy, and road trips, check it out with Athis Arts. I super do. I'm so excited for this. Also, I, I did not ask Gigi, unfortunately, maybe um, if Gigi also wants to say this in the chat, uh, do you have anything you're currently promoting or any social media you would like people to follow you on? So you can uh, check out my work at alanamcfall.com and follow me on Twitter at, at alanamcfall. Um, yeah, I am uh, currently a resident playwright with Playground SF. Um, a, a playwriting a group based out of San Francisco. Um, and because of kind of the last couple of years, we are also now live streaming our performances. So no matter where you are, you can check it out and see some of the stuff we have going on. Thank you so much. Take yeah, care. Thank you. And I'll say one of the things I, I love, and you can go ahead and switch if you want, Greg, but one of the things I love about the book is that um, the story of the ghosts and of the mime are, is, stands completely on its own. But even beside that, the ghosts, like this section, have this whole world where they can see us, but we can't see them, and they play with that. And so, so there's this whole interaction of this whole other existence that they have where we're in it, but we don't know they're in it. And I just, I love that, that play between that. It's one of my favorite things about the book. I mean, among many. 
I've never it's seen so ghost wrong. like ghost mimes before. I love that. That was such a playful scene. I just loved it. <laughs> I really I, I wish that I had remembered to ask Gigi and Carlos if they're promoting anything currently. So again, Emily, if you see them in the Twitch chat saying anything, let me know and we'll you, you can just jump right in. For now, we're going to move on to our next reader, Ether Nepenthes. They, them, Twitter handle at queer underscore of underscore swords is a queer disabled neurodivergent writer hailing from the south of France. Their main occupations are writing relatable, heartwarming stories and keeping up their reputation as the friendly neighborhood cryptid. Ether, if you'll just introduce yourself and the story you're reading from, please. Hey, my name is Ether. My friends are slash them. I'm from the south of France. I am going to read from Diamir's favorite fork, which an extract from my short story, which you can find in full on the Addis Arts Patreon. So, you know, do that. Do check out the Addis Arts Patreon. Neri Cap pulled the scarf down from her face. The world was bathed in warm tones from the low flames of the widest hearths she had ever seen. They twinkled on the copper of the softly bubbling pots and enhanced the ochre of the tiles covering the floor and the walls alike, all the way up to the brutus high ceiling. Had the minotaur been used as a measurement unit, or was it a mere coincidence? Either way, he moved effortlessly between the crates and the barrels which lined up the walls. Welcome to our humble kitchen, he said closing up the shutter to the third and last of the great arc windows. Is this level of lighting comfortable for you? Nerica nodded and hummed enthusiastically. Perfect. Please do find a suitable seat and let me know if you can't. Benches, armchairs, stools, and piles of random things topped with a cushion, all of different width and height. A whole corner of the room was devoted to those. Nerika selected a cute little wooden chair with a pale, jewel-colored pillow and brought it to one of the three gray tables that occupied the center of the room. The tables, too, were of different heights. The one Brutus was sitting cross-legged in front of was pleasantly Nerika-sized. She brought her chosen seat next to him and peeked at the large volume the Minotaur was hunched over. I am checking the dietary requirements for Goblin, he squinted. But I haven't found you in the list yet. How strange. Would you be the first to visit us? Oh, I think that's because we eat everything. There he smiled. Everything, Brutus repeated. But do you have any preference or dietary needs, specific mealtimes? It is the guild's pleasure to accommodate you. Oh, no. We eat when we're hungry, like so. She reached out for the appetizing bouquet of iron skewers in front of her and chomped down the nearest, most appealing one. It crunched deliciously on her teeth, the encrusted gem on the top, an emerald so cool and so fresh, adding an hydrating lightness to taste. <coughs> Brutus slammed the book closed, resulting shockwave almost could nearly get to split her last world to bit. Please do not. Brutus said very slowly, articulating each syllable, eat the cutlery. Nerica swallowed the rest of her food. Sure, how do I know it's cutlery? A fair point, Brutus stated. He was still talking very slowly. It, it is tools you use to eat. All right. How do I know they're tools you use to eat? Brutus' eyebrow twitched. Um, this is um, another approach then. Do you perchance have any sense of personal property? Is it when you're very polite to each other? Brutus blinked, right? This is, I'm afraid, a little out of my wheelhouse. Nerika smiled, put her hands in her pockets, and tried not to eye too much reminding iron candies. Now that Brutus had mentioned it, you could probably eat with those. But what was the point of not finishing off your food, though? Keep more for later? Other cultures were definitely fascinating. 
And that's it from me and Diamond's favorite fork, which just got shoved down in front of your bewildered eyes. If you want to know what happens next to the Goblin, the Minotaur, and all of their friends, you need to check out the Atisar's Patreon. Because if every single one of you pledge just the one dollar to the Patreon, then I can write more of these and more global authors can write more of these. And if everyone looking at this right now would just pledge, once again, the one US dollar, then maybe one global author could write this every single month. Wouldn't that be exciting? That I think that would be very exciting. I'm I for one would be very excited. <laughs> Either that was adorable. Is there anything else other than the awesome At This Arts Patreon you want to uh, hype up right now? Yes, it's not exactly literary related, but I would love for you all to check out something called We Make the Path CAC website, wemakethepath.org, which is a social enterprise workers cooperative that I'm part of that aims to help chronically ill people get their agency back in a world that is so ablaze and um, that I should have prepared a speech for that, but I did not. But anyway, check us out. We're queer, we're here, we're anti-capitalistic, we're super cool. And you, yeah, go and check us out. We, we make the path of the work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. And Ether, Thank you, you Ether, too. Bye. I think Ether is maybe in the Twitch chat and can put that URL there. Oh, yes, perfect. I will absolutely do that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, that was a delight. That was wonderful. It was so cute. It was so adorable. I love like like any accommodations we can make. And no, no, we just eat when we're hungry. Arr, don't eat the cutlery. <laughs> What's cutlery? I don't know. It was super cute. It it just needs this whole cartoon. It needs a cartoon. Um, it does. So it does. Do you want to hire me and my partner to make a cartoon out of it? Because we so <laughs> I would. Wish. <laughs> I wish. I wish like, I once again, if you get on the Patreon, get on the Patreon, <laughs> and Addis Arts can hire me and my partner, who drew a wonderful cover that you can find on my Twitter and on the Artist Arts Twitter. Yes, just give us money so we can survive, please. That would be lovely. <laughs> that, is the, that is the game right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Our next reader um, is going to be Brandon Crilly at B underscore, at B underscore C-R-I-L-L-Y. Brandon has been published by Daily Science Fiction, Apex Magazine, Fusion Fragment, Pulp Literature, and Flame Tree Publishing. He's an Aurora Award winning podcaster, reviewer, conference organizer, and DM. His debut novel, Catalyst, will be out in October. Brandon, will you please introduce yourself and tell us what you'll be reading today? Great. Thank you, Claire, and, and everybody for coming this afternoon. I wear a lot of hats, and it makes me feel tired, kind of, when I hear it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm Brandon Crilly here in lovely Ottawa, Canada, um, and I'm going to be reading uh, just a little snippet from Catalyst, uh, which comes out, I think, in exactly a month, um, which is kind of cool, because it, it comes in October 11th. Oh, it it and is. this is your first reading from it, yeah, right? I have never read publicly from this book, ever. Oh, so exciting. Um, which is pretty sweet. So uh, so I was trying to decide what, uh, what eggs are going to read. And I decided to go with one of my favorite moments in the book, which is like uh, almost halfway through. Um, so Catalyst is a fantasy novel. It's in part a kind of getting the band back together sort of story uh, with these estranged friends who have not seen each other in, in a long time. Um, and so I'm going to read uh, the moment where one of my main characters, uh, Maverin, who is this street magician, um, shows up on uh, the front doorstep of uh, one of his old friends. I, get, I was hoping you were going to say that. I had no idea. <laughs> this is the best scene. I'm going to mute Perfect. so that you don't hear me like doing this Perfect. over the whole time he's talking. Perfect. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah. So, so he shows up on the doorstep of um, one of his old friends who is also an old flame. And uh, just to give you a taste of the sort of the sort of tone of this book. Um, so. Maverin had to count houses, since Yezu wrote the 13th house on the block instead of the actual addresses chiseled above each stone doorway. Halfway down, he spotted a small group of uniformed figures in slate and blue talking in a tight circle at the other end of the street. Maverin spent a minute watching passersby give them nervous glances and wondered what they were investigating, mainly because he had reached Diary's front steps. A small inverted triangle of quartz above the doorway served as the only unique touch, but what it signified was lost on him. First, he shook his hands out and took deep, measured breaths. Second, he checked his pockets to account for every item on his person, smoothing out his tunic and cloak when he finished. 
He cleared his throat a few times, swept his cloak back and forth to loosen it for potential flourishes. The entire suite of pre-performance routines, which he hadn't combined in years, didn't help him feel any better. By the grace of disappearing rings and illusory flame, walk up those damn steps and get this done. Maverick squared his shoulders, smoothed out his tunic one last time, relaxed his shoulders, and then climbed the steps to Diary's residence. Oh, damn it, what if she isn't home? That thought entered his mind after he knocked on her door, and with a giddy rush of nerves, he figured she probably wouldn't be home. It was late enough in the evening that she was likely out somewhere, maybe she went to bed early. He could wait a 10 count and collect himself some more before the door swung open. It went wide, as though the person on the other side didn't worry about being bothered by strangers. But of course, the woman standing there wouldn't. She stood, she stood slightly taller than him, which meant Maverin's line of sight went directly to her mouth. He moved his eyes away instinctively and found the soft lines that had formed along her cheekbones and the streaks of distinguished white cutting through her auburn hair. It hung shorter than he remembered, a little above her shoulders, which seemed rounder than he remembered, unless that was an effect of her woolen shirt, which was considerably fuzzier than anything he remembered seeing her wear. When he found the courage to look her in the eye, he saw a mixture of astonishment, doubt, hostility, and other emotions he wasn't confident finding a name for. He told her once that those eyes carried a depth unlike anything I've ever seen beyond my mere human comprehension. Not because he used to think poetry was an effective way to court, but because sometimes he genuinely didn't have a damn clue what Diary Ren was thinking. I, that is to say, Diary's lips formed a hard line as one of her hands tapped the doorknob. Maverin felt his chest constrict and imagined dropping dead of a heart attack in the middle of the street like his father had. Take your time, she said, leaving the door open while she disappeared inside. Maverin blinked furiously and waited for his heart to stop. Faint clattering inside shook him from his daze, and when his first step didn't kill him, he kept walking until he entered a combination atrium and sitting room. A single stuffed chair sat in the corner between the window and a boxy stone and metal device he figured was a heat well, part of the geothermal system that kept Farglade's buildings warm. A doorway left of the heat well opened onto a staircase that thankfully led down, meaning Farglade's architects at least had some sense. A narrow plaster wall with open doorways on either side separated the sitting room and the kitchen. Sheets of composite covered most of its surface around eye level with scribbled writing on what looked like, uh, or, or what looked like architectural diagrams. He hadn't seen much brainstorming on paper in a long time. Diary must have negotiated and recycled sheets into, into her allotment somehow. She stood over a wood stove in the kitchen with her back to him. The vague smell of cloves came from the pot, which she used to fill a ceramic cup. You came in here to make tea? Can't let it over steam. Maverin noted the narrow shell was mounted on the wall, a cabinet with cooking supplies, and a small table with two chairs. No sign that anyone but Diary lived here. She leaned against the counter, completely nonchalant, and pointed at him with her cup. Looks like you're doing well. For the first time, his waistcoat and cloak felt like a disguise. I'm considering retirement, actually. He offered a nervous smirk that felt about as far from his showman smile as possible. I've managed to avoid dying in a ditch somewhere, at least. She nodded and shrugged. Maverin fiddled with his cuffs. Am I really supposed to take the lead here? She asked. What? I, no, not at all. Uh, give me a moment. You show up after who knows how many years, 16, Maverin muttered, and you didn't even prepare some badly written speech out of a street play? What the fuck are you doing here, Maverin? The sudden vicious anger in her voice made him tense. I'm worried you might be in danger? Before she could respond, he took a step forward, hand outstretched. Well, not just you, the city. We're worried the city might be in danger, and we're here to make sure it isn't. We? Uh, Yezu, he brought me here, told me where to find you. Try not to be angry with him, even though this was his idea. Diary fixed him with a dubious look. You're saying you're here out of the sky because you and Yezu aren't only speaking again, but you're on one of his damned quests? Did you take up hard liquor as a hobby somewhere down the line? The thought crossed my mind recently, but I'm serious, love. We don't, she said sharply, ever call me that again. And that's where the two of them come back together. <laughs> oh my God! What? What? Okay, all right. It's out next month. It's fine. I'm self soothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Brandon, other than Catalyst, which is coming out next month, do you have anything you would like to hype? Or social media or whatever. Uh, what do I get to hype? So uh, I don't think I'm on Twitter. Uh, B underscore, underscore Creeley, uh, where most of my announcements are. My newsletter and stuff is on there. Um, I had an article in Apex that came out like two days ago or something. Um, so that's making the rounds. Uh, I'm going to be on uh, the podcast World Building for Masochists next month, I think. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I'm going to do a, a panel for Sifpla in November. So I got a bunch of stuff coming up, but on Twitter, it's the easiest place to find me uh, with all of what's going on. 
Thank you so much. It sounds it looks really cool. I can't wait to read the whole thing. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Take care. Ede, is there anything from the Twitch we should know about the chat? It just looks like people are having a good time. I hope. Fabulous. Fabulous. I know I am. I mean, usually I'm. <laughs> I'm thoroughly entertained and I'll move on now. Uh, if, if there's, I just wanted to make sure if there was any questions or, or anything we should t hype or talk about. Yes. Next I'm trying to remember to look, cause I'm just having so much fun. You know, I've heard all I've, I'm familiar with all these writings and just hearing them again. I'm just, it's so exciting. I'm having such a good time. And it's always different from reading on the page or having to edit. It's a certain part of the brain, but then to just like sit back and be entertained by the authors themselves is really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Our next reader is Ryan Glenn. Ryan Glenn is a member of Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers with a degree in chemical engineering. After struggling with depression, she turned to writing as a healthy outlet. She wants to write strong female roles and is excited to share her stories. Ryan, if you'll introduce yourself and what you'll be reading from today, please. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm. Uh driving through the mountains right now um so hello from colorado um yeah so i'm ryan glenn and i'll be reading from my third book break of darkness oh it's so pretty oh. <laughs> um, i'm just gonna read a little bit from the first chapter um i absolutely love my trilogy it turned out so great and i'm so thankful for all the work that went into it um so i'll just jump in <laughs> Um, Anna, the wind whispered, carried through the trees. Anna rolled over in her sleep and winced as the rays of sun hit her face. Anna came the wind once more and Anna bolted upright. Blood rushed to her head and dark spots clouded her vision. She blindly pulled a dagger from her belt, holding it out in front of her. As her vision cleared, she spun in circles and examined the trees for whoever had spoken. Hello, she called out. Her grip tightened on the dagger as she took a step toward the tree line. She scanned the shadows but couldn't make out anyone hiding within the trees. The breeze vanished and Anna was left standing alone with the sun beating down on her. She tucked the dagger back into her belt. She'd been camping in the small clearing for a few days now, weary of the shadows and what they might hold. She hadn't seen any wraiths in Stracadia yet, but that didn't mean they weren't out there. Actually, she hadn't seen signs of life in the new land at all. Occasionally she'd hear a bird, but she hadn't seen any animals or people, no matter how far into the forest she traveled. Though she didn't mind being alone, the lack of game was starting to worry her. She went back to her bag and shuffled through the contents. Her armor and weapons were still wrapped and concealed in old rags, as were her ancestors' notes and journals. Holding the ancient books, she saw the barracks when she'd retrieved them. Doors ripped off their hinges, dust and blood littering the ground, fires consuming what little remained. Many of her nightmares featured the destroyed buildings, building littered with shadows. Sometimes she still couldn't believe the sanctuary had been attacked, and it was even harder to believe that the barrier her ancestor created had been destroyed. She'd severely underestimated King Ramir and his wraiths, and she paid dearly for that mistake. Her shoulders drooped and bile rose in her throat. Others had paid too, some with their lives, and that was something she could never change. I'll stop there what oh my gosh that was so fast what about the wraiths what no <laughs> that was okay oh, that, was that was amazing anything. so so yeah okay that's fair you don't want to spoil anything can you show us the cover again and tell us oh, yes. um the three names of the trilogy uh yes actually i have the other two. Oh, i was hoping you did they look so good together very very close yes oh, fabulous yeah, I remember uh, I saw a picture of the designs of all three, and I remember them working together beautifully. Yes, all right, there's number one, Descent of Shadows, and number two, Ruins of Light. Beautiful. And they just look so pretty. Oh, oh I love yes. them. How lovely. <laughs> and these are all, you can find them all on the Athos Arts website, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And with retail, yes. with, on our website with retailings, if you order any print off our website, it automatically comes with the ebook included. Great. And we're, you know, it's hard to get into the young adult middle grade markets, but we are very proud to have books, to have spec fic books for younger readers as well. And we've, you know, I, I love Anna's journey and it just, the, the metaphors, you can read it with them or without them. And it just, it, 
it's so nice to be able to introduce that kind of fiction and to give them something that feels so much older and you know to hold on to so I'm, awesome. we're so proud of that trilogy i love it i'm proud too <laughs> i love that i haven't I seen some of these author. people for a while i was like oh my gosh look it's alana i'm like it's geeky hi ryan i haven't <laughs> talked to you in a while I love the way authors caress their books. I mean, there's nothing like watching an author hold their books, you know, because they they're such they just take such a long time and so much mm -hmm. care and work and to have a physical object after it's all so cerebral for so long and then <laughs> to hold on to them. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ryan. Okay. Have a wonderful journey. Drive safely. Take care. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. If you have any anything else you want to hype about things that are forthcoming or anything? Uh, no. Okay. I think All Ryan right. now did a lot of the, the cons in the area, right? You've been doing a lot of... Um... Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I go to a lot of Comic Cons in Colorado. And, oh, yeah, next weekend I'll be in Salt Lake City Comic Con. So... Oh, great. That's fun. I'm very excited. So if any of you are going to the Salt Lake City Comic Con, try to find Ryan and buy your books. <laughs> All yes. right. Our next <laughs> reader... Thank you so much, Ryan. Our next reader is going to be Ava Kelly. Ava is her twi their tw oh, sorry their Twitter handle is at Thunder Eternal. Ava is a non-binary speculative writer and engineer. Secretly a pile of cats in a trench coat, Ava's goal is to bring into the world tales of compassion, stories that give the void a voice. Ava Kelly, they them. Please introduce yourself and please tell us what you'll be reading from. Hello everyone. I am Ava. Um... I'm saying hello from Norway tonight, and I will be reading from um, Aliatera, Stories from the Dragon Realm, which is an illustrated book, and it's in two languages. I will be reading in English tonight, but if you're curious, it's in English and Romanian. And uh, the piece I chose is from the middle story. So uh, once upon a time, uh, there was a dragon, and this dragon loves flying very, very, very much. But uh, one day there was an accident, and her wing got broken, and she fell. At the bottom of the sea, the dragon curled up in the white sand. Her wing had stopped hurting, but she knew it would never be strong enough to fly again. The water held her there, forever grounded such a suitable punishment for failing in her task. The dragon mourned. Hey, hey, wake up. A poke and another and another. You're in my spot, move aside. The dragon opened an eye. Next to her, a stingray flapped their fins. The dragon looked away, but the stingray flew around and started poking at her other side. It's rude to ignore others when they talk to you, the stingray said, smirking. The dragon huffed, sending bubbles up into the water. What's this? Another voice came from above just before a striped sea snake came into view. The stingray glared at the snake and the snake smiled mildly. The dragon sighed. What do you want? It speaks, the snake exclaimed. Say, do you eat snakes or stingrays? If the former, I'd argue for the latter. Neither, the dragon said, as a rumble shook her stomach. It had been a while, she realized, since she'd had a proper meal. You two, stop pestering her. Can't you see she's hurt? The dragon counted eight fluttering tentacles carrying an entanglement of green strings that, to be fair, looked quite tasty. The newcomer set the offering next to her before swimming back to a polite distance. It wouldn't do not to say thank you or accept the food, so the dragon did just that. If she'd known it would gain her three storytelling chatterers for friends, she would probably do it all over again. Right? Life at the bottom of the sea wasn't bad. Her new friends kept her company, but the water pressed from all around and the sky was so far away. 
every time the dragon tried to fly up, up, and then break through the surface, she got dragged down by an invincible weight. How was she supposed to help people if she couldn't fly? How was she supposed to be useful? The days fell darker, the water heavier, and more suffocating with each attempt. The dragon was no longer a dragon, not without her flight. Only after much insistence and the bribe of five different types of algae did the dragon finally tell her story to the three sea dwellers. The stingray, the snake, and the octopus latched themselves to her neck without a second thought. The dragon returned their hug with her good wing and pretended not to cry. You know, the snake said later as they played by flipping empty shells at each other with their tails, I don't have wings and yet I still swim. He squirmed and wiggled, his tail flopping through the water like the dragon used to, high above the clouds. He's right, the octopus added pensively from the side. She pushed up, rolling and unrolling her tentacles. Yes, the tail is a mighty thing, the stingray said. Their eternally smirking face swam up to the dragon's nose. So maybe you can be a fish dragon. Yes, the other two repeated, a fish dragon, that's right. The dragon considered this. She even wiggled her tail, curled and uncurled, flopped left to right and, oh, she was swimming. Of course, oh my gosh. only part of the story. Oh my gosh! But that's all? Oh my gosh! I just wish that you would have like this YouTube series where you would just read all the stories and show the pictures. I think it would get one million views. <laughs> it was really, really very soothing and very adorable. <laughs> Ava, would you indulge me? And also, sorry, right then a truck goes by. Oh, it's, you know, that's where I live. Um, would you indulge me and also say the title of the story in Romanian? Uh, the title of the story in English is uh, The Dragon at the Bottom of the Sea. And uh, in Romanian, it's called Dragonul din strafundul Mori. And for the book, it's Alia Terra, Stories from the Dragon Realm, Basme din Tarumul Dragonilor. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yes, your YouTube channel must be in, in both languages with pictures everywhere. Yes, I see. Another Kickstarter. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so oh, much. It was so beautiful. There will be an announcement at the end of this um, show, broadcast, celebration, whatever, all of these things. And it will involve many of the people. So we'll wait for that. But um, I'm just going to, you know, hold that for a moment because. All right. Evie. There will be, that's there will good. be an announcement. If I, if I forget that that's sorry. happening, just interrupt me and tell it because I don't know what the announcement is. It's exciting. I await in anticipation. Glorious. Uh, Ava, do you have anything else you would like to hype before we go move on to the next reader? I would like to say that there is a Alia Terra surprise coming up very, very soon. And Emily is going to talk all about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. These announcements are working together. I feel a conspiracy, mm -hmm. but I am happily caught in that particular dragon web. So we will move on. Thank you so much, Ava. We're going to move Thank on you. to Kella Campbell. Twitter handle at K-E-L-L-A-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. -L -L. Kella writes mostly romance in Vancouver, Canada, and hopes you'll fall in love with her fictional rock band, Smidge, tea drinker and martial <laughs> artist. Kella, if you'll please introduce yourself and tell us from what you'll be reading today. Hi, I'm Kella Campbell. I'm in Vancouver, BC, and I'm reading a flash fiction story. So I get to read the whole thing because it takes less than five minutes uh, from this lovely anthology community of magic pens. And there are, oh my goodness, so many great stories in here. And I feel so lucky to be a part of this one. Um, and I'm reading a story called The Taste of Words. In the kitchen, she shared with three roommates. Lucy wrote out a recipe for pasta sauce as she worked from an online cooking video. Gourmet chefs on student budgets. She could never cook from other people's written instructions, had to learn and understand a recipe by seeing and making it, 
noting down quantities and steps as she went. Two cups chopped onions caramelized in pan. Outside it was snowing and the falling flakes looked faintly pink as they twirled through the air. A trick of the light probably, the peachy glow of sodium street lamps coming on or a few rays of sunset penetrating the clouds. Snow wasn't pink. The chopped onions had just gone into the pan, still sharp and tear inducing, but as Lucy sucked on the end of her pen, a childhood habit she couldn't break, she could already taste their sweetened brown caramel flavor. Puzzled, she glanced over at the pan. No, the onions were still white and raw. Crush and add four cloves garlic, she wrote. She touched the end of her pen to her lips and the sharp tang of fresh crushed garlic roared through her mouth until she dropped the pen and reached for her mug of tea. Taking a blank recipe card, she wrote chocolate dipped strawberry, then deliberately licked the pen. Yes, there was nothing in her mouth. She hadn't eaten a bite, and yet the decadent taste of chocolate mixed with fresh berry sweetness was unmistakable. Did you see how the snow seemed to turn pink for a bit earlier? She asked her roommates when they got home. They hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. Have you ever licked a pen and tasted the words you'd been writing? She wanted to ask except that it sounded patently ridiculous in her head, and she couldn't imagine that it would come out better aloud. Through the evening and morning, she kept trying. Different pens, different kinds of paper, different words to taste, and all of them worked. She wrote expensive things she'd never tasted, like caviar and saffron, and strange things like gasoline and dirt. She went to a lecture and took notes about the French Revolution, and every time she forgot and sucked on the end of her pen, she tasted blood and bread and something sour. Lucy ran into Jeremy at the library in the afternoon, both of them there to study. We could sit together, he asked. He had the kindest eyes she'd ever seen and a stubbled jaw she wanted to touch. And the way his clothes hung on him made her think he'd be lean and strong in all kinds of interesting places. But one couldn't just tell someone that. They sat. After a quarter hour of itchy silence, during which Lucy contemplated but refrained from writing something like Jeremy's skin or Jeremy's lips and licking her pen. She softly said his name. He looked up. They were alone in their corner of the library. She couldn't hold it in anymore. If you suck on the end of your pen, she said, do you taste anything odd? Only since yesterday when the snow looked pink, but it was probably just the light. He grinned. Let's see. He wrote mint on the corner of his notebook. Like that? Then he touched the pen, the end of his pen to his lips. Holy crap. Not just me then, Lucy asked, feeling warm all over. She couldn't tell if it was from relief at not being alone in the experience or the fact that she was sharing the experience with him. Fascinating, he muttered. He wrote coffee and licked his pen again, nodding. I wonder if it's the person who wrote the words or the pen. He bit his lip and shot her a half embarrassed, curious look. Would you be super grossed out if I licked your pen? I'll wipe it after. She shrugged like it was no big thing and hoped she wasn't blushing. Write something, he said, but don't let me see it. So she wrote cherries behind her hand and passed her pen to him. Mmm, cherries, that's what you wrote, right? He asked. When she nodded, he smiled and handed her pen back. What about something you don't know the taste of? I think so. I wrote caviar last night and got a salty taste, but... I see what you mean. It could be your imagination filling in. We need a provable test. He looked around, then wrote Lucy's lip gloss and licked his pen. Well, their eyes met. He chuckled. I could ask to pour your lip gloss now, or mm, there's a more direct way, Lucy said. If Direct is good, said Jeremy, and leaned in to sample the lip gloss from where she applied it. The pen taste effect faded with the winter weather and was completely gone once all the snow had melted. Years later, Lucy asked Jeremy if he thought anyone else had discovered it and not said anything, just as they hadn't said anything. Probably, he said with a grin, wrapping her in a loving hug. But we don't need to know. Oh, I just, <laughs> I just it was very sweet. Oh my goodness. It almost does what very few things do, do and make me long for winter, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's to be beautiful. fair, I wrote it in the winter. Yes, 
Yes, it's, you know, cozy winter stories like that come complete with chocolate cherries and lipstick. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, thought we could anything... use a little romance today, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I didn't know we were going to get it. You know, Brandon gave us some as well. And so, and, and you cannot imagine how many years Kella has been putting up with me in all ways imaginable. So. <laughs> I love that. Kella, is there, up with. A, a treasure is there... in my life. Yeah, it's all about love. I mean, there's been so many stories so far about friendship and love and, and art. Uh, there's so much about art. I've just been really digging it. Um, Kella, is there anything that you want to talk about or hype or be excited about while we have you here? Well, uh, romance is probably not this crowd's usual thing. If you do read contemporary romance about rock stars, uh, Rockstar's Heart is the first book in my series. Excellent. I'm working on the third one. Anyways, contemporary romance, rock, rock stars, a little bit steamy. Uh, but I do love writing a short speculative fiction for Emily. So <laughs> I love romance. I love mystery. I love SFF. I love horror. So I'm really glad to know Rockstar's Heart. I will look for it. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Such a pleasure to do this. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. <sighs> Our next reader, you will be delighted to know, is our very own E.D.E. Bell, she or a, at E.D.E. Bell author, is their Twitter handle, loves fantasy fiction, thrives on community, and is the writer with dreams behind the small press Athis Arts, at A-T-T-H-I-S-A-R-T-S, -T -T and the author of Night Ivy, Lord's Dome, and Just Bart. Follow Air Adventures at edebell.com. Ede, you want to introduce yourself and say what you're reading? Yes. I mean, I I have to be at, to participate in my own party. So I just, so uh, I'm going to get a little fancier now. I have the, you have know, scarf for it. This is very, a very, very dramatic performance that I'm about to offer and then make Gregory follow it. So this is going to be wonderful. Um, I'm going to put this up here and hopefully, okay. So I actually, you were talking about the books. I, thought, I should have got my book. I wasn't paying attention. So I did just, you know, you saw me hop out. This is Night Ivy and I'm very proud of it. And um, I, I'm very proud of the, the sequel, which someone here has read and I'll be announcing the title at CanCon. But I'm not reading from Night Ivy today because um, I decided to read something much sillier. I mean, very dramatic and serious. And also this was a particular turning point in our press when we really switched gears and went all in on this press, and I mean all in, all in, um, as told by things was our first anthology. A lot of lessons learned on that, a lot of really wonderful stories in it, and this was a piece I wrote for that. So if you're not familiar, it's um, stories told from the perspective of inanimate objects. And when I thought of such thing, I thought, what is the funniest object? That was my prompt, self to prompt. What was the funniest object? Now that could go a lot of ways, I know. But this is the one that I wrote about, and um, I think we're all, I haven't even looked over to see if we're all set. Oh, I'm actually on the screen. Look at that. Okay. So I will now read to you uh, the masterpiece of flash fiction that I have written, Tragedia. <clears throat> okay. It awoke with the sensation of warm lips encompassing its cool flap, sealing it off from the air around it. Aware now, yet unable to breathe. It gasped at the warm breath being pumped into it, one measure at a time, bringing life, awareness, full, tight, spirited. A royal tribute, it felt itself lowered down like treasure to a throne of honor. Tall beings in crisp dark garments backed away, awed at what they had done, what they could create perfection. Time and space held and balanced, poised for the moment of reckoning, the moment of release. A man entered in a similar garment, a bright ribbon draped around his neck, towering, stately, sure. With harsh words, he proclaimed judgment and orders to his subjects, what had been and what would be. From above, his taut cheeks lowered toward their raised seat. Tailored pockets accented a smooth fabric, dancing the lines between black and gray. Lower, lower, complete. 
Flatulent winds ring out in jubilant abandon, heralding a hero. From all corners, laughter filled the air. Joy, elation, being. Without warning, awareness faded away, the darkness enveloping. And that was Tragedia from It's Told by Things. <laughs> okay, wait, was it a whoopee cushion? I mean, yeah. Jubilant! <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I got. I love that breath gives it life and farts take life away. Blessed be. <laughs> <laughs> you got the and full that, sound effect. Like, no problems. Full sound effect. Yeah, and um, so uh, Chris Bell and I spent quite a bit of time this morning troubleshooting because all of my microphones would actually filter that <laughs> sound out. So you don't know the things that Discord and Zoom and other apps are actually doing on your behalf. <laughs> but they, they are working hard at that, apparently. So, um, I mean, on my behalf, but your behalf, perhaps. So, all the hoops you had to jump through to make the noise. <laughs> there were test runs. There were all sorts of things that happened. Amazing. So, <laughs> thank you for letting me do that. <laughs> and uh, Emily, do you have anything you want to uh, hype right now? Or are you going to save that for the end? I'll save the announcement for the end. But, you know, you can always find me and all my little links and these cute little icons at edebell.com. Um, there's the press at thisarts.com, but then there's also, um, and I would just emphasize what Ether said better than I could, which is we we want to use the proceeds from the Patreon for us, but also to pay global writers for things that, um, you know, people that really could use use that exposure, use that income. So um, the more, basically, the more we get on that, the faster we can buy more things with it is what it is. So I encourage you to at check it out. Arts Patreon. Awesome. Yes. And um, <laughs> other than that, I'll check back at the end. And I have um, a special treat of my own, I think, is, is next on the agenda. So, Which I find hilarious that, that, you, that you thoroughly cracked Greg up before making him go right after you. Uh, he was like falling out of his chair. I was watching. He is as wicked to me as I am to him, <laughs> which you will find out because I am about to hear what he's about to read for the very first time myself. Well. Um, on screen. Gregory A. Wilson at Gregory A. Wilson, Twitter handle, is a speculative fiction author, college professor, musician, podcaster, game master, and Twitch TV host, our Twitch TV host. Learn more about him at GregoryAWilson.com. Greg, please introduce yourself and what you're reading today. Hey, everybody. Um, it's been a pleasure to watch and listen to all of these readings. Uh, so yes, my name is Gregory A. Wilson. I'm better known on this channel anyway as Arvin Elleron, the host of this channel, the runner of this channel for a while. Uh, and I'm going to be reading from, as Emily said, for the first time, I think, in public, the opening to the sequel to this book, which came out in May. This is Grayshade. Um, we just had a Kickstarter for it. We've got a bunch of stuff happening with it, including this. And uh, I have uh, <laughs> slashed and burned substantially to get down to a reasonable number, so I hope I'm within time. I think I am, um, and I'm going to read the opening to it, uh, but it will be split into two parts, so I'll explain uh, very quickly when the break happens um, so I can get this in. So this is the prologue to Renegade, uh, the sequel to Greyshade, um, a book about an assassin who kills in the name of his god. The snows would come with a fury. Sweeping west from the scales over the glassada into Silleraine, the wind would cover the villages and towns and their sometimes complacent residents in a retributive blanket of white. Everyone in Elskeg said so, and most of them had seen enough winters to make the claim credible. But the snows had not yet come, and in truth, if one had fallen asleep for months and suddenly woken now, they could be forgiven for believing it was still summer, even if it was barely two months until the turning of the year. It was hot enough that the workers trudging back from the iron reaches were sweating by the time they reached Elskeg, even in the evenings. Hot enough that I'll take this swill that passes for ale, thought Ress sourly as he took another deep drink of diamond tear brew from the stained wooden mug in front of him and sighed. Everyone in Elskeg also said that the water here was more pure than the center of the glasada, and gods knew that was a lie to end all the others. But at least it was cold and that was a mercy in itself. Rest sat at a table in the almost empty common room in the mountain's heart, one of two taverns in Elskeg, and by far its oldest. 
The other, the fan and feather, had only been in Elskeg for two years and had taken over much of the mountain heart's business. A bigger fire, better ale, and, according to rumor, other services. That might explain why finding a seat or a room there in the evenings was well-nigh impossible. But even if there had been a hundred free chairs, Ress would likely have avoided the feather in any event. The mountain's heart had been a fixture in his evenings for two decades, and he would be damned if a pretty face and a more palatable drink would sway him from it. Besides, the heart's bartender Gallard was always nicer to him on paydays, and as Rest looked over at the mostly full bag of coins sitting near his mug, he knew he'd have a few more hours of as much diamond tear brew as he could stomach. He had just allowed himself the smallest of smiles when the front door to the tavern flew open, smashing against the interior wall with a bang as two men stumbled into the room. Ress's smile vanished as he saw the uniforms they were wearing. That's what you get for thinking you got everything under control, Ress. There ain't nothing stays the way you think it will. Section break. At first, Ress said nothing, but when he heard footsteps drawing close, he looked up to see the two soldiers standing above him. You don't talk? Rannick asked. Ress didn't respond. Well, I was talking to you, Rannick went on, his voice suddenly quieter. Still am. I can't help noticing you got a pouch of money next to you. A lot more than you could ever spend unless I miss my guess. My friend and I here seem to be a bit low on funds, and uh, we'd appreciate a bit of assistance. Ress still said nothing, even though he felt his face growing hot. He simply shook his head and turned away. I don't think you heard my friend here, Kester said more loudly. We need help, and we aim to get it. Just a few coins will do. But you act as dumb as you probably are and we'll take the whole bag and leave you a few reminders of what you wouldn't give us willingly. Ress's knuckles were now white as they curled around the mug's handle. Eat spit, he muttered. Rannick laughed. <laughs> Some spirit, eh? That's something different for a change. It's nice to have finally someone show at least a bit of a spine. With this last word, he grabbed Ress's shoulder and pulled him backwards hard, knocking his chair over and him with it. Now you're going to give us the whole bag, and now we're going to teach you a lesson, he said, drawing his sword and standing over Ress as he struggled to pull himself to his feet. I think he made it quite clear he wasn't interested in giving you any of his own money, friend, a low voice said. All three men looked over to see a hooded figure standing alone in the shadows by the door. Ress couldn't remember seeing anyone else beside Gallard and Kalish in the common room. There was no second floor, and he would have heard the front door open for a newcomer, the way it had for Rannick and Kester. But there the stranger stood, hands by his sides, eyes glinting in the reflected lantern light. "'I don't recall asking you for an opinion, friend,' Rannick said, a slight sneer playing over his face. "'In fact, I don't recall asking you for anything at all.' So I'd keep your mouth shut and find another place to do your drinking. Those places seem to be hard to find around here, the stranger replied. Wherever I go, someone's ordering someone to do something they don't seem to want to do and convincing them with a fist or a blade. It makes mealtimes unpleasant. I didn't think anyone here had fight left in them, Kester said, drawing his sword. It's too bad we ain't got more around to see what it looks like. Or what happens when you show it to a soldier? Step off, Kester, Rannick hissed, crouching to pick up his sword from the ground as he watched the hooded man warily. This Raylar waste is mine. He stood again, holding his blade in front of him. The hooded man remained motionless. I don't know why you think it's worth throwing your life away over an old dirt eater like this, but you made your own choices. The stranger said nothing, and after a tense few seconds, Rannick pulled his sword back and charged towards him. Ress caught what might have been the glint of a smile from within the depths of the stranger's hood. Rannick swung as he reached the hooded man, but his swing passed through open air as the man was already gone, cloak swirling. Rannick whirled to find the man behind him and swung again, but again the stranger was gone. Snarling, Rannick turned, but even as he did so, something connected with his face, and with a grunt, Rannick fell heavily to the floor and lay motionless. The hooded man stood above him, holding a curved blade with the pommel outwards. For a moment there was dead silence. Then Kester ran at the man, sword above his head, shouting wildly. The stranger did nothing until the last second, when he stepped out of the way of the soldier and, although it happened so quickly, Ress couldn't be entirely sure of what he was seeing, pushed him towards the wall of the tavern. 
Kester ran into the wall with a sickening crunch, and without a word he toppled backward onto the ground, his sword sliding out of his nerveless hand at impact and coming to a rest just a few inches from Ress's face. The whole business had taken, perhaps, fifteen seconds. What in the hell's... Ress crawled backwards along the floor, eyes wide. The hooded man picked up the metallic ball from the ground and placed it within his cloak. Then he tossed something to Gallard, the barkeeper, who seemed to catch the object out of reflex. It made a jingling sound, like a bag filled with coins. Then the stranger turned and left, the door slamming shut behind him. For a few moments, Rest simply stared, his brain struggling to process the silent Gallard looking dumbstruck at the bag in his hand and the two unconscious soldiers. And then the thought came to him, urgent, overwhelming. That's your chance, you fool, and you're letting it walk away. Head aching, he scrambled to his feet, grabbed his bag from the table, and ran from the mountain's heart into the night, following the stranger and his hopes. <laughs> you do not mess with Grayshade! Don't mess with yeah. Grayshade. So that is from the opening to Renegade, which is the sequel to Grayshade. Renegade will be out next year. And um, yeah, I hope I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, dealing with a bully in another way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, are they really unconscious or are they kaput? No, they are unconscious. Grayshade doesn't kill unless he has to. Okay. Um, so they're yeah, unconscious. I, I mean, later on, who knows what happens to them, right? But at least at the moment, you know. That was I just, that. you know, there was a curved sword and a potential assassin. And, you know, I guess he, he knows his own strength. He's so fast and so shadowy. I was actually I, loving your reaction, by the way, I should say, um, Claire, when you <laughs> when you were when, when I mentioned the voice and both you and Emily smiled and you're like, and I was like, yay, someone knows about this character. Oh. <laughs> so but anyway. even, even if we didn't, when somebody says it, that, in just such a voice, it's just like, oh, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You know, like, you could probably potentially read book two without having read book one. I often read series out of order because I like to backfill and then go yeah. back and read the earlier ones. Be like, when I write, ooh, and then get surprised by all the, you know, I, yeah. I don't mind spoilers or anything. So it's so exciting. Yeah, I, I'm I'm excited for it, um, and um, I'm excited for uh, Emily to um, to get her hands on it and uh, to do to do her amazing work on the we editing side. That. But yes, no, I know, I know. So there you go. Now now Emily's done. heard it for the first time too, or at least a portion. All, of it. Is it all done? Is that manuscript complete? Uh, it no, it's uh, I mean it's it's a finished manuscript in draft, but I'm going through okay. now before I send it off for the edit draft. So yeah. So it's, you're going through a new draft, then Emily will edit it, then you'll have another draft, and then. It'll be like copy edits. Exactly. Oh, it's so close though. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's exciting. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Is there anything you would like to hype particularly? The right big now? one the big one is the one that's in the channel right now that Arudinel just listed. Uh, that is the Gray Shade Backer Kit. We are definitely encouraging people to go over there. We're starting to get orders for Backer Kit for Gray Shade. Also, if you want to pre-order that book you just heard, a Renegade, that and Heretic. Uh, Heretic will be the year after. That's the third book in the Gray Assassin trilogy. Plus, there is a tabletop role-playing game being designed by Brandon O'Brien, and uh, I'm very excited about that. Uh, that's going to be coming out next year. And there's also an audiobook of Gray Shade being done by our very own Trent Sparks and Trent is an incredible voice uh, audio narrator um, I mean I'm, I'm lucky that I'm in in a chat with an incredible audiobook narrator with CSC Cooney but beyond that uh, Trent is amazing and uh, you should definitely check his work out so all that is at that link so if you go there and pre-order and do all that stuff we'd be grateful Thank you so and, much, uh, Greg. Both and, and artists again, and Night Ivy are both on that backer kit store too. If it's a hassle to go over to the, you know, to order from two places, if you're ordering anyway from the Gray Shade store, you can add Rogue Artists with Carlos and Claire's stories and also as many of the rest of us. I have and, a story um, in there and a bunch of others, yep. And the Night Ivy hardcovers can be signed and personalized, so. Mine arrived recently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have Night Ivy. It's now mine. I also have Gray Shade. I have all them all um so without further ado and again thank you gregory not only for just reading in an awesome awesome way an awesome thing but thank you again for hosting us on your twitch channel oh my pleasure thank you for letting me read and being and having me host it <laughs> well moving on to ls reinholt and minerva caridwen they have been writing fantasy and sci-fi together for nearly a decade their short story, Dragon in the Cove, was in five minutes at Hotel Storm Cove. And Minerva, if you will please introduce yourself in the story you're reading. So I'm Minerva, uh, and we will be reading Dragon in the Cove from, indeed, uh, five minutes at Hotel Storm Cove. 
Uh, and bear with me, please, just one minute while I get the two pictures, because there's two folks here for this. So just give me one extra second, please. Uh, talk amongst yourselves <laughs> while, I, while, I get the, <laughs> while I get this other capture done. Minerva, do you have anything you want to hype right now? Uh, yes, we have uh, an anthology where, where we both have a story, written a story together. Uh, that's Skulls and Spells from Artemisia's X. Uh, and Alex is showing it now, but I don't know if you can see it yet. Yep, you can see now. Names are coming up quickly. Oh, fabulous. Okay. Be there in a moment. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and uh, I, of course, have uh, The Dragon of Anis, my novella. Uh, it's a fairy tale and it's out with Atlas Arts. Uh, so you can find it on the website over there or via my website. Or on my bookshelf, I have two copies. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank Minerva, you. It looks, like, it looks like you're in the Twitch chat. If you uh, could put the title afterwards, just put yeah, the title yeah. of the <laughs> anthology for people to check out. We, uh, I'll do that. we feel very strongly about here at Athos Arts is supporting all the small presses. We are, so many are doing quality work. We we love to to promote each other. You know, we, as, as CSC Cooney often says, we rise together, so. That's true. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think I have everybody, but just names. I, if you can get started, if you like, I'll get the I'll get the last name up there. Um, and just to be clear, Minerva, I believe, is on the left as we look at the screen. If I've if I've got that right, is that? Uh, is, your name is right. right. Okay, I'll I'll have your name up in just a minute too. Um, but you may proceed whenever you like. <clears throat> Finally, the little dragon hopped up onto the rim, sniffed the steam, and dove happily into the tea sending a spray of brown droplets out over the white tablecloth as it disappeared beneath the surface. Oh, the waiter said as he returned with the second teacup. Let me get you a napkin to cover that spill. No need, Professor Brand said kindly. Sorry about your cloth. I'd be happy to pay for a new one, since I doubt this will be the last stain. As if to prove that point, the small silver head rose out of the cup and spit out a thin jet across the table. That is some good tea, it chirped. The second cup clinked in its saucer as the waiter nearly dropped it. What? What is that? He squawked. The professor blinked at him. A Draco Agentius, of course, can't you tell? Professor, dragons are category by restricted creatures. For safety reasons, they are not allowed in public places, including the suites at Storm Grove. How did you smuggle it in? I did not. It was right there in my pocket, the professor replied, in, replied indignantly. Surely your receptionist must have heard the snoring. I do not snore. The dragon pulled itself back up onto the rim and shook the tea off its wings, its tail twitching with vexation. The people at the tables around them were, at this point, watching the scene unfold with evident fascination, chattering amongst themselves. What is going on here? A young dwarven woman, wearing a lime and blue pantsuit and a Storm Cove staff name badge, hurried up to them and gasped as the dragon hissed. What is that? Still a Draco Agentius, Professor Bran answered flatly. It was in my pocket when you checked me in last night. I don't understand why it's suddenly a problem. I did not, the receptionist squeaked. Oh, that sound. I thought it was your phone. A puff of smoke escaped the dragon's nostrils as it glared up at her. She cleared her throat. I'm sorry, we cannot allow a category pie creature in the hotel. Who are you calling a pie? The dragon spat. No one, the rep professor replied, looking amused. And don't act so offended. You love pie. Anyway, I think it's clear that those rules do not apply to my traveling companion here. It's a fire hazard, the I waiter not wailed. A fire lizard? The dragon huffed. You need a wizard, an old ogre who had been snoozing at the table next to the professor croaked. He stood up and wrapped the edge of the table with his cane. Is there a wizard present? He called out. We need a wizard. Several dozen people scampered from the terrace and Professor Brand sighed. This was to be expected. No magic practitioner throughout the country dared answer the traditional call for help without written approval from the insurance company. 
Not again, the waiter groaned. Perhaps I can be of assistance, a rich voice sounded behind him. Startled, the waiter jumped aside and Bran saw a regal elderly woman in a black suit and hat approaching. Thank you for the offer, the professor said, but there's not really any emergency. The woman tipped her hat. Then I apologize for disturbing you. She was about to turn away when she spotted the dragon. I do declare. Is that a Draco Argentius? I haven't seen one of those in decades. The dragon preened, flicked its tail and then looked up at the professor. I like her. No, we can't keep her, Professor Brand chided. She has things to do. Nothing urgent, the woman said, pulling out a chair across from the professors and sitting down. Definitely nothing more important than this. She offered her hand, but before she could introduce herself, the waiter interrupted. Are you just going to ignore us? He crossed his arms. Rude. The dragon shot a diminutive flame at him, making the receptionist gasp. I'm sorry, but the creature can't stay, she insisted. It's simply not allowed. Oh, miss, the woman laughed. This is not just a creature. It is a very rare specimen of the smallest of the Parvi Draconis, all of which were exempted from the Pericular Directive in 1934. What? What? There's more? <laughs> is there more to the... the... There is definitely more. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's so adorable. Again, I wish for a YouTube channel and, and <laughs> illustrations and cartoons and the two of you reading it. It's so cute. I oh, I could see it very clearly in my head. Like, like it should be a Studio Ghibli thing, you know? <laughs> we can definitely live with that. <laughs> if you can make that happen, I mean, we would be grateful. <laughs> Wouldn't I love that power? Like, wave my magic wand. Hey, Studio Ghibli, guess what? Have I got a story for you? And the new to go with it you got you're so wonderful thank you so much thank Would you. you like to um uh well i guess do you want to hype up anything currently uh I, you were you would mention something right before you read you want to mention it one more time just uh, knock it <laughs> we have written a bunch of things together and the newest one is a horror fairy tale in skulls and spells by uh artemisius x cool. uh, it doesn't have a dragon but it has a small talking snake Excellent. And so it's, it's horror fairy tales? Yeah. Ooh. Well, ours is a fairy tale, um, and I think most of them are, but the theme is horror. Very cool. Oh, it's a very beautiful book, too. It looks it is. Like, satisfying to hold. And, 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 <laughs> and we were very pleasantly surprised to find that we're the first story. Oh, that's fabulous. Starting it out right. Perfect. And the interior is in color. It has art. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. Skulls and spells? Yeah. Perfect. Artemisia's axe, correct? All right. Well, check it out, chat. Absolutely. Thank you so much, you two. You're welcome. Oh, my goodness. Well, we only have two more readers left, and I am the next one. It's always very awkward to introduce oneself. I write under the name C.S.E. Cooney, and you can find me at Twitter, at C.S.E. Cooney, or Instagram, at C.S.E. Cooney, C.S.E. Cooney.com. Or if you want to see stuff Carlos and I are doing together, or like Carlos stuff, we've collapsed our last names together. His is Hernandez and mine is Cooney, so we call ourselves the Hernan Doonies, right? So if you wanted to go to HernanDooney.com, you could see other stuff too like sometimes con schedules or what latest awesome project he's working on or things we've collaborated on um what blah, 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 blah. i won a world fantasy award for my collection bone swans in 2016 other notable work well other works include <laughs> dark breakers desdemona and the deep and saint death's daughter so just out this year i've had my collection dark breakers and saint death's daughter come out and they were the work of uh saint death's daughter was 12 years long to took to write it and and dark breakers was seven about seven years so they have been a cumulative experience um and uh, many works of poetry fiction song i'm working on a podcast musical theater podcast right now with two friends it's all very exciting but and today. I can help with the introduction a little so we're not it's not just you because people might have heard me tell the story on Twitter but when I first read this story for rogue artists um I you know I I was like oh wonderful I'll see a Cooney story I'm very excited to read this and I was reading it and we live in a bungalow it's very old and small and has no sound barriers whatsoever 
and I kind of forgot that I was like here in my porch office and I I was sort of making like noises and murmuring and saying, oh, she can write. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> Ooh, and like I won't say, but, and then I kind of realized, I'm like, what if one of my kids are like in the hallway, what, you know, <laughs> but it was, it was very immersive. So I'm very, very excited to hear you read from it. Uh, and I will be on mute. Don't worry. Nothing will, you know. I was really excited to write it because I've been wanting to write a theater story for a while and you know sort of like what theater story what's my story what's my theater story I'm going to write when I don't want to write just one obviously but um Carlos and I have created a, a role playing game called Negocios Infernalis and it's coming out next year with Outland Entertainment but it has a deck of cards like oracular cards that we outside of the game often use to pull to inspire us for stories and when we had some stories due for rogue artists, we were like, let's pull some cards. So both of our stories come directly from card pulls. But um, so this is, uh, I'm gonna start in the middle, but basically there's a theater troupe called Teatro Milagro that has been operating in secret during a pretty um, dictatorial regime, sort of like during a, a kind of a, like an inquisition in this land called Espada that's recently loosened some of its harsher rules. So the theaters come back out into the light and they're trying to decide what they're going to be and what they're going to perform. So this is right in the, just the middle, a couple of sections. I don't remember which one of us thought up the idea of La Cámara de los Sombras. Not one of mine, or even Yasmin's. I truly think it was one of those group thoughts that seemed to form in the air like a new note of music hovering above a harmonizing chorus. Our troupe is so tight-knit now, this happens more often than not. I put it down to all our mask work. I first noticed this cohesion when we were devising our Los Lobos piece, back when we were still in hiding. The audience would cram in to see us, all word of mouth. We pasted no broadsides in those days. And sit among the root storage or dusty wine bottles, right there on the dirt floor, and watch us actors do nothing but loll about. But we lolled about as wolves. We wore wolf masks and did wolf things. Hunt lazy be beavers, educate our sprightly pups, care for our sick and injured, mourn the passing of our elders. We would pretend that individuals from our audience were tree stumps to be marked, carcasses to be sniffed, or perhaps strange wolves to be howled at. You'd be surprised how often the audience howled back. Yasmin played the human hunter, come for our pelts. We never knew when she'd arrive, clashing her cymbals in a murder of sound. The terror of it. We'd all respond the exact same way, every time. Startled, urgent, springing up, bounding away. You cannot rehearse this unity. Not exactly. You can only prepare your body as best you can to empty itself, to allow the wolf in. When we wear the masks, we become one. Not just with the masks, with each other, a pack. Some of us weren't quick enough to escape Yasmin the hunter. The very young wolves, who knew no better. The very old, too stiff to move. But some nights, the weak ones did escape, when the strong wolves stayed to fight. We never knew, in any given performance of Los Lobos, who would survive at the end, the wolves or the hunter. How many wolves would die? How many pelts the hunter would take? If the hunter would return, bleeding and triumphant, to her hut or not at all. Section break. We were raided once during a Los Lobos performance, our last. We lost Javier that night. The priests took him, charged him with the usual crimes brought against actors, prostitutes, and bookies, unseemly exhibitions and extravagant acts of dissipation. No trial to speak of, but found guilty. Sentenced to a term of incandescence. This did not necessarily mean execution. Had it been spring or autumn, Javier might have served his sentence and been released. Starved, perhaps, filthy, certainly, and louse-ridden, but alive. But it was high summer, and so, under the leaden roofs of La Diosa's temple palace, Javier was sweated dead, like so many others. The priests hung his effigy, wolf mask and all, over the barred doors of the old royal theater, in La Plaza de la Fe, 
Not that Javier had ever played there, nor any of us ever dreamed of it. It was a statement. The hunter would always come for the wolves. Beasts deserved no better. Section break. <laughs> we had no plans to revive the Los Lobos project for Teatro Milagro. We wanted something new, something that ended in a feeling of luminosity, of tenderness. For how, we asked ourselves, could we live in this new light? We actors, yes, but we as Spadans too, from the hobgoblinish gutter snipes to the queen herself, if we did not publicly acknowledge and exorcise our cultural darkness, eh? We made it sound like a haunted house. A lark. Come to La Camara de las Sombras. Run the gauntlet of your nightmares. Watch as your past sins take shape before your eyes. You will face them. You will move through them, beyond them, and out the other side into the light. At the end, a feast. We claimed, publicly, brazenly, that Teatro Milagro would provide what previously only La Diosa could bestow. Ritual expiation for anyone brave enough to buy a ticket. What else was theater for? So, you wanted to find out what else is happening in that story, Rogue Artists and Origins Anthology, and that's available nice. from Africa. And if Marie watches, Marie encouraged it to be Rogue Artiste. So Rogue Artiste. Rogue yes. Artiste is such a good book. <laughs> and Carlos is in it, and Greg is in it, and a bunch of people are in it. That's the great thing about an anthology. So, you can buy my book, Saint Death's Daughter and Dark Breakers, found wherever books are found. It is my year for saying that a lot, because it's a year that they came out. And moving on, we're going to move on to Jazz. Jazz, they, them, 29, serial hobbyist and procrastinator, bi and queer, horror and cat enthusiast, has many strongly worded opinions, but like cool ones. Jazz, if you'll introduce yourself and what you'll be reading from, please. Oh, he's still connecting to audio. We'll just wait a few seconds. Emily, do you want to talk about Jazz a little? <laughs> I'm not going to talk about, I'll let Jazz talk about Jazz, but I will say this story, I, I have already been outed saying that this is my favorite <laughs> short story. And, um, like, and, and I was like, I told Jazz, I was like, what if I was just in the moment? And what if it's, you know, so I go back and read it sometimes. And I'm like, no, it's still that good. Like, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to like spoil it, but so many layers in such a sport space, s short space, like, honestly, and, and you know, I, I love, if you're watching this, I love all your writing. You're all amazing. You've heard like, cute dragons come out of teacups, all of it. But this is how you do flash, in Emily's opinion. So, so thanks for uh... on now. <laughs> yes. Oh, can you hear me? Am I? Oh, okay. I was hoping not to completely ruin the VOD by having all of my audio not work. So. <laughs> but yeah, thanks, Emily. No pressure. Absolutely no pressure. <laughs> no, I know you can handle it. It's going to be so good. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, hi everybody. I am Jazz Ray. I uh, I wish I had stuff to plug, but alas, I am just a baby here because, uh, like I said, like Emily said rather, I I wrote her favorite short story, so I'm gonna hopefully do it justice. <laughs> okay. Monday, December eighteenth, twenty seventeen, room fourteen oh four, one twenty six a.m. The sounds of wind shuffled papers and a soft eruption of bubbles surround you. As if in protest, the action of biting your lip produces only silence. You sure this is gonna work? The lighter skin of your palms burns brightly in your periphery as you twist a stray lock of coiled hair around a finger. The young woman across from you huffs. <sighs> like I keep telling you, it only works as much as you feel it. These spells feed more on what you mean by them than what you put in them. Your eyebrow raises. So if I really think about how I want it to work, it will? Something like that. The two huge afro puffs whip around as she leans to look at the clock in the room. I'll be quiet. I gotta concentrate these last five minutes or it won't work that well. The sound of your tongue clicking is louder than you expected. Thought you said that don't matter as much, you mutter. Shh. An easy tension fills the space between the two of you. Her long, elegant fingers, nearly as dark as the midnight sky, trace innate patterns with the cinnamon stick into the sludge filling the little cauldron. Mug. It's some mug shaped like a cauldron. Takes heat well, though, and it was what you had on hand. She said it would be fine, and you trusted her. You take a quick glance at her face, something not unlike wonder, 
maybe the crushing feeling of gratitude expands in your chest. It had been a bad week. Hell, a bad month. Well-meaning ma'ams and misses shot like bullets, the occasional baby girl piercing deep into your stomach and churning it. She left two sections out of her buffs, twisted out to four makeshift bangs. In the low light, you imagine they twitch and shift like antenna as she hunches over the makeshift pot. You get the feeling she doesn't need to be that close to it, but maybe she's even worse with people than you are. Yet somehow, here, huddled in the bathroom of a hotel room, watching some low-key social media witch brew you a magic potion, you feel infinitely more powerful than you have in a long while. Yo, Miss Witch. The force of her glare is muffled by your curiosity. Not curious enough to get her name, but curious enough to ask, how'd you afford this place anyways? The intensity in her glare dims. Sometimes you just gotta whisper sanctuary and the right ears will catch it. Her face softens further and her hand starts to go slack. Your chest grows tight. Damn it, you didn't mean to trigger something. Uh, so how do I use this stuff anyways? I just drink it once and suddenly everyone's calling me sir or something? She seems to shake the memory off at the question and her grip returns. Ah, oh, man, why I look like a damn miracle worker? Your chest uncurls and you can breathe again. It's just a temporary glamour. Take a violet and for the next eight hours, people gonna be more likely to see you as you are, not for what they wanna see. And go fix all your problems, but it'll take the edge off of some of the worst days. For the first time since you met up with her, she looks at you, really looks at you. Your eyes meet hers directly and she gives you a small smile. You can't help but return the gesture. Why are you doing all this for me anyway? I asked for a tip in your DMs and you drag me here to make a whole ass potion. You mean it playfully, but there's an edge of desperation in your voice. A gripping need to connect to the strange young woman in front of you takes hold. The stirring stops. Glass clinks together as she grabs some small jars from the purse you forgot was sitting next to her. She carefully starts to pour some of the sludge in one of the jars. They're just... Ain't a whole lot of us out here. We gotta look out for each other, yeah? Especially in times like these. You screw the lid onto the last of the jars right as your phone begins to shriek. 1.31 a.m. She's looking right at you as you try to catch her eyes again. Thank you. Those words aren't nearly enough to convey how you feel right now, but they're all you got. She fails to hide a grin and the shake of her head. Just help me clean up. And that... Uh, was my short story. Awesome, Jazz. So awesome. Thank you. <laughs> what a perfect note to end on. Oh, it's so great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank that you. Thank you for the invite. Life too. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was in my room just like with the door closed, practicing voices and inflection for for a, a little bit. So I had hoped to do it justice. Oh yeah, the voices. I mean, Perfect. I'm a professional audiobook narrator, so trust me when I say your voices were amazing. Oh. I was super into it, and it was just so natural and so, and yet so like dynamic. Uh, anyway, I could just go on how awesome it was, but thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Us. Thank you. Take care. Yes. Thank you too. Bye bye. That that book is a bit of a running joke with a lot of the people in this in this reading and in this chat because I I went a little farther with it. Well, that's a story for another day than I intended to. It became a whole endeavor, and um, but I do love my ho Hotel Storm Cove, and so you know. So Hotel Storm Cove available at Atlas Arts, full of stories. Oh, you've heard several from Hotel Storm Cove today, I believe. At yes, least the, two? the dr Dragon in the Cove was the and also uh, this one and. They all happen within five minutes, all within the same hotel. They're in the past, the present, future, different genres. And as you saw in Jazz's story, what really, uh, the short version of the story is the, the hotel was just supposed to be a fun setting. You know, what will happen there, a heist or a, uh, an affair. And it became, in these times, it became a metaphor for shelter and community. Sanctuary. And kindness and sanctuary. Oh, so great. And, and it just, it's just such a book. I just couldn't be prouder of it. So that sounds like books, a book that one is that very people, very close to me. That sounds like a book people might need if they need a, a place to hide for a while or a place to heal. This I love the idea of a sanctuary book. Like, what's your sanctuary book, Chat? Where, what do you give to people when they're hurting? I love that Hotel Storm Cove is that for some people. Um, Emily, do you want to? 
hype anything currently uh, because we are just about out of time, but I want to leave some space for you to make announcements. I do have an announcement and it's an announcement. I, I I did some chatting, make sure everybody's okay with it. So this this is something I'm very, very excited about. Um, and I'll, have to, I'll put it in chat in just a moment. So it's partially, it's hard for me to even say it because you're gonna be like, are you really doing this? Are you really going on Kickstarter again? And the answer is yes, because you know, you know how much I have put into Kickstarter efforts and you know, we, we know that. So uh, yes, we are absolutely doing another Kickstarter, but this one is like incredible. It, I am throwing everything I have at it. And you know what that means, that, you know, that means a lot. So first of all, the Kickstarter is to fund, ready? This is very exciting. An audiobook of the Traveling Tree, Travel, I can't even say it, Traveling Triple C Incorporeal Circus by Alan McFall and read by this person, C.S.E. Cooney. The amazing voice talent. So that's what we're trying to fund is that audiobook to, you know, just to hear that story read by C.S.E. Cooney and Ghosts it, it just, and Mimes! Ghosts and Mimes! Ghosts and Mimes on a road trip across America. It's, it's, it's all the thing. I'd love that book. It has the specific element and the paranormal element, but it's also like a lot of Athos Arts things. There's kindness and friendship and what is life really mean and, and who are our families? You know, those are all the themes that come through in a lot. So many of these stories that you've heard today and another, rather than, you know, it, Kickstarters are having a little bit of a tough time right now, just in general people, it's, it's difficult to get attention in the book world. So I'm um, amping this one up a little with some extra spice. And so we are going to also promote our 2020 catalog. Many of those books, or 2022, what year is it? 2022 catalog. A lot of those um, books that you heard from today, there are six primary ones. And those books will all have a treasure, a custom exclusive treasure that is sold through the Kickstarter to help raise money to fund the audiobook. So I won't go through them all now, but for Gray Shade, there will be a Kukuri and en hard enamel pin so that you can wear your dagger and give one to a special friend. And there is going to be custom candles. Uh, and it's, this is also gonna support a lot of small businesses in the area in Michigan and Ohio and such. Uh, custom candles uh, for Night Ivy. And wait till you, the description of it is, is so good. And so there's gonna be a lot of fun things. I'll, I'll wait till everything else sort of, um, ah. See, there's only one thing better than an author touching their own book and that's seeing somebody else touch your book, but anyway. So it's going to be really fun. And I am going to, right now, I would like people to follow it. So I'm going to put it in, let's see if I can do it, right there. Um, you can just follow it for now. And I want to wait till the other things sort of are more solidified before I announce them. But there's going to be really fun. So for um, Alia, oh, I did say I would say this one. Alva's probably out there. Emily, um, Alia, Alia Terra, Stories from the Dragon Realm. One of the reasons that we came up with this idea of combining the two sort of ideas of the audiobook and the treasures is that people were asking us, I love Matthew Spencer's illustrations. I love Ava's words. They're kind and healing and these dragons and this magic. I wish I could color it. So we are doing that. We are going to be printing uh, through this Kickstarter a uh, coloring book version of Alia Terra Stories from the Dragon Realm. So that will be the treasure for Alia Terra. That's we will so also have a treasure to be announced still from one arm shorter than the other by Gigi Gangoli. We will also have um, a custom handmade um, treasure, which I will wait to announce for rogue artists, for rogue artists, and also the pins for Grey Shade. And we will have something very special for Brandon Crowley's Catalyst and then the candles for Night Ivy. I think that was six. If not, somebody <laughs> jump in. No so yeah, please follow that. And there's going to be a lot more on that soon. We're, well, I'll say this, we're hoping to run in November, just throughout the whole month of November. And I think we're on track for that. I think that's a good, a good time. And we want to get this funded and we want to hear CSE Cooney read our story. And um, we're very excited about that. And and I guess the, before I hand it back to our, to uh, Gregory and to CSE Cooney, I would just like to say thank you for reading today, for attending today, for supporting our small press, you know, I won't get it. You, you know, you know, all of it, you know, all of it, the, the messiness and the glory and the me. And I'm just so grateful to all of you, just genuinely, truly grateful. So I hope this was fun. That was what we wanted to do today. I, it was fun for me. I know that, but I hope it was fun for you too. So uh, I guess I will pass this back to, to Claire and Gregory for the ending of the show. Thank you, Thank you so much, Emily. You're Thank from you. Ferndale, Thank Michigan. You. Emily, Athos Arts, Michigan. Follow them at Athos Arts, athosarts.com. 
thank you so much for joining us. And back to you, Greg. Well, it was a great honor to be able to read uh, and listen to and hear and connect with all of the folks doing the readings today. So uh, first of all, thank you again to um, Emily Bell, Emily and Chris uh, with Athis Arts are doing really, really great work. It has been a great honor to be published with them. And I think you can see from the level of work that you've heard that they are continually producing good stuff. I also want to make a quick note that I am sure um, CSE Cooney will agree with me on. Also really excellent readings. Uh, uh, you know, very well practiced and, um, you know, thoughtful and funny by turns and all that. Um, but it was it was good, not rushed, well paced work. So good stuff on yeah. the reading point of view. Darling, adorable, powerful work. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I was like, I was into it. You can tell when people have been rehearsing because yeah, yeah. the timing was great. Yep. Really just beautiful. Absolutely. Um, so I want to thank them for that. And I uh, want to thank, of course, the incredible people. First of all, the folks who often come to my channel. Thank you for being awesome as always. I'll you know finish up by saying something about the channel at the very end. Um, and of course, all of the authors and the folks who stuck around and friends and family of the authors and all those who came by. So thank you and spread the word and please follow all the things and uh, support this in all the ways you can because we need more good small presses like this producing good work so thank you for that um and of course i would be remiss if i did not thank our host uh csc cooney for doing such a wonderful job uh radiant as always in the explanations in the descriptions in the hype in the uh you know quality of um emceeing i guess you might say and of course in her own work so claire csc cooney thank you um for doing the hosting for this today um, it was my honor. Thank you. And last and but certainly not least, I'll say that for folks who are like, this is pretty cool. I wonder if anything else happens on this channel. I'm glad you asked because there are things that happen on this channel, um, quite a few of them. I, of course, am an author and a college professor, and I focus a lot on narrative and games, so I play a lot of tabletop on here. But I also do, of course, a lot of writing-related stuff, not only readings like this, but also other works. We are hosting a number of Infernal Salons starting very soon from C.S. E. Cooney and Carlos Hernandez for their new upcoming game Negocias Infernalis from Outland Entertainment. That is going to be starting on this channel very shortly and you're going to see those regularly from them. There are also of course reading sequences that are done uh, as part of a variety of things. I should mention since Brandon Crilly was on that also Brandon and Mike who raided towards the end of this uh, session, uh, Michael Underwood, Brandon and Mike uh, both run something called Bag of Giving which is a charitable affair um, that uh, supports numerous different sorts of charities. Uh, season 1 has ended but Season 2 is beginning in November, so you should definitely stop by for that. Um, and of course, Speculate, um, which is my podcast, an actual play podcast that I co-host with Mike Underwood and Brandon O'Brien, is doing a lot of actual play stuff with many awesome and amazing authors, and you can see that here as well. So if you want tabletop, if you want role play, if you want readings, if you also want some RPG video games, and just a few bouncy horses, which, which is an inside joke for Hillness in my chat and Emily in our group, if you want to see all of that stuff, um, please make sure to follow the channel here, uh, twitch.tv slash Arvin You can follow me on my Twitter at, at Gregory A. Wilson and uh, check out all the work that I'm doing there. I will say that we will be back on Tuesday with the beginning of a new game, Lost in Random. And then that evening, we will be finishing up Purgatory, an amazing voiced game with my voice team of Zach Clay and uh, Little Red Dot and my own daughter, um, uh, Little Arv, otherwise known as Senevine, who both uh, Claire and Emily have met. And and uh, we'll have an opportunity to hear her uh, as her voice stylings before the semester really gets underway. So I think that's it for me. Um, we're not going to do any raid or anything like that today. Um, but I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you to Athis Arts. Thank you to uh, E.D.E. Bell, to C.S.E. Cooney, to all the readers. And thank you, of course, to everyone who would chat was listening. Um, thank you all. And we will catch you folks soon. Bye-bye. Um,